Hello, my name's Stuart. I'm the curator of the Cromwell Museum in Huntingdon. It's my great pleasure to be with you here again this afternoon. Uh, again, recording, I'm afraid, from home as we're still in lockdown in the UK at the moment. Uh, but talking about various aspects of the 17th century to inform, entertain and hopefully uh, bring to life this fascinating period of history. Today I'm going to talk about not history so much itself, but actually its impact on the English language. How there are various phrases that over the years have become, rightly or wrongly, associated with the Civil War period. And I'm going to talk a little bit about seven different phrases that are still in popular usage even today, and how they may or may not be connected to the time of the Civil War, and in a couple of cases even to Cromwell himself. Um, so uh, let's kick off by choosing the first of these particular phrases. So first of all, uh, sent to Coventry. Um, it's an old-fashioned phrase, but it's still used sometimes today. It's, it's a phrase that's used usually to describe the process by whereby somebody will ostracise someone. Uh, if there's somebody you don't like very much, you'll ignore them, pretend they're not there, refuse to speak to them in any way at all. And there's various uh, origin stories connected to this, but the most popular one seems to be that the town of Coventry in the West Midlands, which of course is very famous for its uh, two cathedrals, uh, one which is of course was, uh, destroyed during the Second World War uh, and the modern one next door to it. And back in the 17th century during the time of the civil wars in this country, uh, Coventry, like many places in the West Midlands, was a die-hard parliamentarian town. And according to tradition, royalist prisoners of war who were sent there were treated very badly by the local population. And when I say very badly, they weren't roughed up or anything, they just simply refused to speak to them, have anything to do with them, turned their backs on them in the street, because they basically re refused having to do with what they saw as their enemies. And this practice supposedly is what led to the idea of being sent to Coventry. Now this is uh, kind of a bit of myth mythological, but um, there are certainly references to it. Even the Earl of Clarendon sort of talks about in his writings the way Coventry sort of treated some of these prisoners of war. So it seems quite likely that that's where this origin of this phrase came from. Second of our phrases is hoist by your own petard, um, which uh, again seems a slightly curious turn of phrase, but it's still used even today. It's usually where um, somebody does something to try and harm somebody else, but actually ends up being damaged themselves in the process. Um, somebody, if you like, are kind of being blown up by their own bomb. And uh, this has quite often been associated with uh, the Civil War period because a petard was an explosive device commonly used in this period. Uh, actually, the origin of the phrase originally is Shakespeare, like so many uh, turns of phrase we find inside the English language. And uh, actually, it's a line from how the uh, play Hamlet. Uh, it's actually a line given by Hamlet himself, uh, Act 3, Scene 4, if memory serves. And... Um, as a result of which that's kind of gone down into the literature and the original quote is something um, for it is the sport to have the engineer uh, hoist with his own petard. Now this idea of being hoist by your own petard, a petard was an explosive device. Uh, incidentally by the way the uh, word petard comes from a French word in term derived from a Latin word um, Basically, it's the sound of giving off wind. So basically, it's a fart. Okay, So uh, a petard, you could argue, is a fart bomb. Uh, what it actually is, in terms of Civil War terms, was a, uh, a device, an explosive device, used to breach the walls and particularly gateways during sieges. Uh, imagine a large kind of bronze or iron bucket strapped upside down to a wooden plank, packed full of gunpowder, and with a fuse sticking out the top, rather reminiscent of something from a Tom and Jerry cartoon. And the idea was that you had a couple of brave souls who were going to run up to the gates of a castle or fortification, uh, hook or nail this onto the gates of the fortification, light the fuse and then run like hell in the opposite direction. Uh, the idea was then the explosion would come out the base of the, uh, the petard, blow the gates open and the besiegers could then get inside. Of course, doing this was rather a risky business because if you didn't run fast enough, you ended up risking getting blown up with it, hence hoist by your own petard. So that's where the origin of the phrase comes from. Um, it doesn't actually date from the Civil War period, but it was a device that was used commonly at this time. So our next phrase is keep your powder dry. Um, so this is usually where you, you're sort of a, a phrase sometimes that people use even now, where the idea is that you'll wait calmly and see how something develops before taking action. 
And um, tradition has it that this particular phrase is attributed to Oliver Cromwell himself. Uh, supposedly the original quote was that he gave to his soldiers uh, that they were to trust in God and keep their powder dry. Uh, the power Keeping your powder dry had a more literal meaning uh, in the 17th century in terms of the gunpowder that was used for priming and loading firearms. And of course if the gunpowder gets wet then actually it's not going to explode and your gun's not going to go off. So hence the reason keeping your powder dry. Um, there's, it's a lovely turn of phrase and uh, it sounds very Cromwellian in its origin. Uh, unfortunately we've no evidence that Cromwell ever actually said it. It's purely tradition associated with it and in fact actually the earliest reference we have to this phrase at all is from a Victorian poem. Uh, there was a poem written called Oliver's Advice, written in 1834 by a man called William Blacker, um, and uh, it's the first time that this particular phrase appears is in that poem, so it may well be a piece of poetic licence that's simply been attributed to Cromwell ever since. One of our phrases is lock, stock and barrel. Um, that means the whole thing, everything together, of course. And of course, it's been associated with other things as well. You know, Guy Ritchie movies, amongst other things. And um, the reason why this might well kind of uh, go back to a, a phrase being associated with uh, the Civil War period is that, of course, it's the three constituent parts of a firearm, uh, particularly muskets in the 17th century, um, when they were originally quite often assembled um, from three different parts made by three different manufacturers so um, uh, wood turners making the wooden stocks that the actual bit that you hold on to of the gun um, then you've got the the lock which is the actual firing mechanism and then the barrel which of course is the tube that contains the actual um, gunpowder charge and bullet and the three constituent parts put together makes the whole thing the lock stock and barrel of a gun now, although there are actually references to lock, stock and barrel being used together in a phrase like that, uh, going back all the way back to the 17th century, the idea of it being used to kind of uh, portray that particular piece of imagery doesn't appear again until the 19th century. And in fact, actually, the first reference that certainly things like the Oxford English Dictionary cite are Sir Walter Scott in a letter in 1817, talking about something being lock, stock and barrel in the context of being a, a comparison for something being the whole thing together as we use it today. So, um, it, uh, you know, it's a nice image again associated with the 17th century, but doesn't seem to particularly fit from this period. So uh, then there is flash in the pan. Um, flash in the pan is a phrase we use today where something might look quite spectacular, but it actually turns out to be a bit of a damp squib. You know, it looks very sweet and impressive, but actually doesn't symbolise anything in particular. And uh, actually this, uh, again, is something that's associated with 17th century firearms. Uh, when you load and fire a musket, uh, you have on the outside in the firing mechanism a small pan, the flash pan, into which you put a priming and charge of gunpowder. Uh, into this uh, you create sparks either by plunging in a piece of burning match cord with a matchlock musket commonly used during the Civil War period uh, or by striking a flint and steel together on a flintlock musket. Uh, flintlocks increasingly come into use during this period. Uh, this lights this small charge and then in turn it's supposed to set off the main charge inside the barrel of the gun thus firing the bullet out and, and, and obviously discharging the weapon. Quite often, though, if there was a, a blockage in the little touch hole that sort of joined the flash pan to the main charge in the barrel, then sometimes only the charge in the flash pan would go off, so literally a flash in the pan without the gun itself actually going off. And, and this was quite a common uh, malfunction uh, with 17th century weapons. Now, whether or not this dates specifically from the Civil War, we can't really tell, but it certainly seems to be something that did originate in the 17th century and is associated in this period. Uh, there's a letter, for instance, uh, in 1687, where somebody's writing about one of John Dryden's plays, and they use this image of a flash in the pan to describe uh, Dryden's work. So uh, certainly it's very much a 17th century image, and it may well date from this time. So, warts and all. Uh, I suppose we're coming to the big one now, really, aren't we? Um, and it's the one that's most famously associated with Cromwell. Um, the idea that if you are shown warts and all, you are depicted as you really are, with all the blame issues, um, the good side and the bad, as opposed to just kind of showing a positive image. And this kind of guy fits very much with Oliver Cromwell's image. He seems to be, in many people's minds, the sort of man who uh, basically was very bluff, very straightforward, and very much wanted to depict it as he really was. 
So where does this phrase actually come from, and is it really true? Did Cromwell really say it? Well, there was a portrait uh, painted by Sir Peter Lely of Cromwell around about 1653-1654, uh, of which there are several contemporary copies that were made, one of which we've actually got in our museum's collections. And uh, so the story goes, Cromwell went to have his portrait painted by Lely, and um, uh, Lely, who of course was used to painting many of the great and the good of the period, and uh, shall we say romanticising them slightly, removing their blemishes, which is of course entirely possible when you have your portrait painted and you might want to be shown in the best light, same way as today a, a photographer might use a bit of Photoshop to kind of clean up a to photograph of someone. And uh, so Lely kind of rather tentatively asked Cromwell, so the story goes, uh, how he would like to be painted. And, and to get the quote right, um, Cromwell says to him, Mr. Lely, I desire you would use all of your skill to paint my picture truly like me and not flatter me at all, but to retain all the roughnesses, pimples, warts and everything as you see me. Otherwise, I will never pay a farthing for it. Now that's allegedly what Cromwell said to him, and, and the result was this famous painting which does quite show, clearly show Cromwell's warts. Now, did this really take place? Well, first of all, um, it's, it's interesting to speculate whether or not it really was to Lely that this particular phrase was given. Uh, various academics have challenged this and said, actually, if such a conversation took place, it might have been between Cromwell and another artist, Samuel Cooper, who also painted Cromwell quite regularly and also shows uh, Cromwell's warts and blemishes in many of his pictures. Uh, the problem with all of this is that um, actually the first reference we have to Cromwell actually making this particular comment is actually in 1764. Uh, Horace Walpole, a famous 18th century writer, wrote a book on anecdotes of painting, and he was the first person to describe this particular scene and quote this quotation and describe it to Cromwell. So it's over 100 years after Cromwell died. We've no idea whether he actually said it, uh, whether it was simply a piece of um, folklore that Walpole overheard from somebody else or simply made up. Um, it's a lovely story but we've no idea whether it's true and even if it is true as you might have heard from the quotation actually we're misquoting it. Cromwell said warts and everything not warts and all. Uh, warts and all is a later simplification of it so even if he really did say that I'm afraid it's a misquotation so um, maybe we need to start saying warts and everything instead. Now we come to our last one. This isn't a quote this is actually a nursery rhyme. And um, this is probably the most controversial of all the uh, different quotes and things associated with the 17th century. And this is the nursery rhyme Humpty Dumpty, which I'm sure most of you know. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Certainly most children in Britain and in many parts of the world will have learned this wonderful nursery rhyme. And it's this image of uh, usually an egg sitting on a wall, uh, falling off and getting cracked as a result. Now, there are various theories about where this particular story comes from. Um, the most likely one is that it's associated with a term for a 17th century form of drink, and the idea of people falling over and get, having got drunk, then that, that might be associated with it. Um, there is also uh, various images going back for a long time of it being an egg falling off a wall. That's a, uh, The idea of Humpty Dumpty being egg-shaped as a character is, goes back a very long time. In the 20th century, there are a couple of theories that come up that associate this nursery rhyme with the time of the Civil War. Uh, back in the 1950s, a writer, uh, a, a history professor, came up with an article in which he suggested that uh, Humpty Dumpty was actually referring to a siege engine uh, built by the Royalists to attack the city of Gloucester in their siege in 1643. Uh, Gloucester was a parliamentarian town, and the Royalists built a uh, like a kind of covered siege engine so that they could approach the walls safely and try and break inside. Uh, unfortunately the siege engine uh, got stuck in a ditch, toppled over, uh, hence the idea of Humpty Dumpty had a great fall, all the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. So the story fits quite nicely. The small, small problem in the fact that there's no direct correlation, no evidence at all that ties the two things together other than purely an academic suggestion. Um, there's no sort of suggestion at the time that the engine was called Humpty Dumpty or anything of that sort at all. Um, in the 1990s, a, a rival theory also came up, um, which is associated with the town of Colchester in Essex. This rival theory suggested that um, the uh, Siege of Colchester, which took place during the Second Civil War in 1648, 
a the city or the town of Colchester was defended by the royalists, and they mounted a cannon up on the wall, uh, the roof of one of the churches there, the Church of St Mary. And the idea was that this cannon caused a lot of destruction against the parliamentarian forces as they were attacking the town. So as a result of which, they targeted the church, the tower was felled, and of course the cannon collapsed and couldn't be reassembled. So again, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, had a great fall, and the king's horses and king's men couldn't put him together again. Again, it's a lovely theory, um, but again, there isn't very much to associate it with the original nursery rhyme and tie the two things together. Um, and particularly when you bear in mind that the early versions of the Humpty Dumpty nursery rhyme, actually the wording is very, very different. Uh, Humpty Dumpty had it sat on a wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Uh, four score men and four score more come, that could not make Humpty Dumpty what he was before. That's the original, um, uh, or the, at least the earliest recorded version of the nursery rhyme, which carried on like that right into the Victorian period. The modern wording with king's horses and king's men only appears in really in sort of the early part of the 20th century. So um, really the idea of it being associated with the Civil War is nice in theory, and it's great that various towns have come up with theories about how it might apply to them. But probably when you look back at the etymology of how the nursery rhyme developed, unfortunately, it's fairly unlikely that that's really the case. So that's uh, a few bits of English language and how they're associated in some way or another, or actually in many cases, or not as the case may be, with the times of the Civil War and with Cromwell himself. Um, there are as many more Cromwellian quotes we can talk about as well. He's very, very quotable. And uh, we'll talk about more of those in a future video. And of course, as we go through these uh, days, weeks and months to come, we'll talk about uh, many other things into the bargain. Um, hope you found that interesting. Um, if you did, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel to below. Um, also, don't forget to like the video as well. Um, please also do follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, the museum is an independent charity. We rely on the generosity of our visitors to help support the running of the museum. So if you feel able to do so, uh, please do make us a donation as well. Uh, please stay safe during this lockdown period at the moment. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon and look out for our next video. Thank you very much.